Welcome, you guys. So we're back again with the next chapter of our Exodus Bible study. Today we'll be doing chapter 34. Once again, my name is Pastor Divin, newly, newly ordained pastor, Pastor Key. And then we also have Apostle Robert Miller as well. So chapter 34, we're reading from the New King James Version. Our first subtitle is Moses Makes New Tablets. Now, if you were watching the previous chapter, you know that Moses had previously went up the mountain and while he was up the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, as he was, you know, speaking to God, the people that were Moses was leading, they got back into sin. So they made a golden calf. They started partying. They started going back to their old ways. And God saw this and he was ready to kill the people. So he told Moses to go down there and set everything straight. And Moses was so angry that the people had somehow lost their, you know, they had pretty much lost their cleanliness. They had been made clean coming out of Egypt. And as they were coming back down the mountain, they had lost their cleanliness that fast. So Moses was angry. He broke the tablets. So now when it says Moses makes new tablets, Moses is going back up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments once more, because as I said before, he had broke the tablets. So that's what we're at in chapter 34. And without further ado, let's get it started. And the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. And I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth and keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin by no means clearing the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Then he said, if now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. So I'm going to stop right there within that first little subtitle. There's two parts that I want to speak on, and I'll kind of break it up in two parts and let, you know, Apostle Robert give his opinion as well. This first part I want to talk about is verse two. So chapter 34, verse, verse, let's see, verse two or three. Now, let's say verse four, chapter 34, verse four. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. So the, the important detail in that specific paragraph is simply the fact that even though God was preparing to do this great work, he was preparing to give Moses the Ten Commandments once again. He was prepared to give his people the laws that they needed to enter the land of milk and honey. He didn't do it all by himself, right? So what's most important about that is Moses is following his calling, right? He's called to be a deliverer of Israel. And now that he's delivered Israel, he's now called to be their leader. So his, his calling has shifted, right? It shifted from deliverer to their leader. As he's leading the people, there's still things that must be done. However, even though God is in charge of providing the results of these occurrences, God is not going to do everything. And I think that's very important because we don't we need to understand that in our own personal lives, when we're called to something. Right. Say, for instance, God calls you to start a Bible study and God will give you the revelation that you need. He will give you the understanding that you need, you know, but he's not going to read the scripture for you so that you can be able to relate it and break it down to the people that you're supposed to impact. Right. God may allow us to understand the gospel so that we can make more disciples. But God is not going to go out to the country club and spread the gospel for us. He's not going to go onto the YouTube platform and set up our YouTube page for us. We have to provide something, some, some type of a service. Right. So we have to we have to learn how to partner with God. 
Not say, you know, I'm waiting on God to do it. I'm waiting on God to do it. You don't wait on God to do it. You do what you're supposed to do, and then God's going to meet you. Because we see that right here with Moses. Moses broke the tablets, right? God could have just made the tablets appear out of thin air, right? That's what some people think God is going to do. When you say God is going to bless you, some people wait and think money is just going to fall into their lap. But that's not what God does. What God does is he waits to see if you're going to prepare yourself. Prepare yourself for this blessing, and then I will bless it. What we see with Moses is Moses had to cut the, the, the tablets of stone. So the tablets of stone that the Ten Commandments were written on wasn't given by God. Moses found the stone. He cut the stone. Then he took the stone to God so that God can write upon the tablets. So it was a partnership. There's things that must be done for us to live out our calling or our purpose. You know, we can't just say I'm sitting around waiting on God because what God is looking for is, are you going to take that initiative and do what needs to be done? Like do what you can do, do what you can do, and then I'll do what I do. And that's why we see um, later on in the New Testament where Paul says, you know, one of us may plant the seed, another one may water the seed, but it's God that brings the increase. There are things that we can control. We must do what we can do to help God or not help God, but just do what we can do to make ourselves useful, and then God will bless it. Whether he chooses to or not, doesn't choose to, it's not going to happen if we're just sitting around waiting on, you know, waiting on our hands and knees. But if we're actually doing what we're supposed to do, then we give God the chance to bless that thing. So that's what I want to speak on in that first portion is the fact that we must learn to partner with God as opposed to just waiting on God and not making any movements. That's good. Um, and, 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 and remember that, that every person has a purpose. God has a purpose for every person and, and not everybody accepts that purpose and, and steps into that purpose or walks into that purpose. I think a, a good mindset here that, that Moses shows us is he's ready to do this. So, so he was intentional, like, like, um, Pastor Devin said, um, God didn't give him the, the tablets he took initiative. He took the tablets to God. So, so in his heart, he's ready to do this. He's like, okay, I'm ready to do this. He takes these tablets. He goes up to God. And then he says, now, what do you want me to do? Because he's, he's going to inscribe. He's like, okay, I'm ready to do this. I know you have a purpose. I know, I know you want to speak. I know you have a plan. So what do you want me to do? You know, and, and, and sometimes we don't uh, think that God wants to use us. or we don't think that that we're in a place to be used by God. Uh, so we don't even ask God, God, what do you want me to do? You know, um, how can I serve you and serve your people? What do you want me to do? W what have you called me to do? But Moses shows um, how um, each and every one of us are to present ourselves to God. He even says in the scripture, present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. So he presented himself to God, you know, and so that's what I want to say. I, I know somebody's watching. Many people have been watching. I've been getting inboxes about people that have have watched these videos and they say they are truly blessed by these videos. Um, but know that you do have a purpose and, 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 and God is not God is God is waiting on you to step out into the purpose. Sometimes we're waiting on God and God is waiting on us. Amen. <laughs> The second part I want to cover in this first um, eight to 10 verses is the part about, um, what is it? Verse, verse six. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. By no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. The reason why I want to cover that is because generally I've taught this. I'm sure Apostle has taught this and many other you know, ministers have taught this as well. This is the foundational scripture for where we get the, the message of generational curses, right? Because if there's iniquity or there's sin residing in us and we don't Clean, clean ourselves of that. We don't repent of that. We can't be forgiven for it. So the scripture tells us that God is merciful. He forgives sin, iniquity. 
He says he forgives sin, iniquity, and transgression. So whatever words you want to use, God is able, more than able, and willing to forgive it if you confess it. But it says by no means clearing the guilty. So you're guilty if you don't confess it. You're guilty if you choose not to repent. So God is by no means will clear the guilty, but he's going to visit that same iniquity upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So not only will you suffer in your life because of the things that you choose not to repent of, but your children and your children's children and their children's children, if this thing is not, you know, if it's not tackled head on, right? So usually when I think about generational curses, um, obviously you guys, you know, whatever you're going through in life, if, if it's of that nature, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. But like when I think biblically about that, I just think of like the battle between David and Goliath, right? It's not the same exact situation, but it's very similar because Goliath wasn't an enemy of David necessarily, right? Goliath was actually an enemy of Israel. He was an enemy of the nation of Israel. And Saul was the king of Israel at that time. But the army of Israel was too scared to confront Goliath. So he, instead, he spent 40 days speaking evil of God and speaking evil of God's people without being challenged, without being hindered, and without being attacked. He did this 40 days. The army of the Philistines and the army of Israel was in a battle, in a locked battle. And Goliath was saying, if I, if I take out your best warrior, then you guys will become our slaves. And he said, if y'all take out me, if your best warrior takes out me, we'll become your slaves. And they were scared to even, they were scared to move. They were scared to fight. Nobody wanted nothing to do with Goliath. So the only reason why Goliath became an enemy of David was because Saul refused to confront it. And that's why I look at that passage as if it's, it's not a generational curse per se, but it's exactly how that works. The things that we choose not to confront, the next generation must confront it. Because as you know, David was the second king of Israel. He inherited that enemy. He inherited the Philistines from Saul because Saul did not, you know, end the Philistines. But even if you want to look even further into the scripture, before the Israelites had a king in the book of Judges, Samson was anointed to defeat the Philistines. Samson's calling was to defeat the Philistines, but because he didn't follow his calling and he allowed his lust and Delilah and the Philistine woman to get him off of his purpose, the Philistines lasted way longer than they should have. So they, they outlasted Samson, they outlasted King Saul, and they got defeated by David, even before he was a, even before he became the king of Israel. But his, the enemy was inherited throughout all those generations because nobody stepped up to stop them because everybody got caught up in doing whatever they wanted to do as opposed to serving God's will. So that's what I want to bring up about that generational curses and bring that scripture to life because that's, that's what I think about it, you know? Whatever we don't confront in the present time that we know needs to be confronted, somebody somewhere is going to have to confront it at some point or is going to continue being a curse that, that plagues the generations forever, you know? That's so good. That's so, that's so good. Great teaching. Um, man, it, I was just thinking, because yesterday uh, when I picked up our daughter, Faith, and she's only 11, and we were walking in the store, and, and, and you know, I, I've shared things about myself with her, you know, from my past, and then, you know, she, she talks about other people that are in her family, you know, to do things, so we were passing by um, where they sell the alcohol at, mm -hmm. and she was like, Daddy, you don't drink the wine? I said, you know, I've, I've drank wine on occasion with family, I said, but you know what? I chose not to. I chose to cut it all out of the way. And then I told her, I'm doing that for you. I'm doing that for you because I don't want you to think that that's something that you should get in because everybody doesn't, I don't, I can't say I was an alcoholic, but I know when I used to drink, when I was in the military, you know, it became more habitual, right? You know, some people, some people are worse than others. Some people are not able to be a social person that maybe on occasions uh, once a year or, you know, twice a year that may have a, a glass of wine or something like that. You know, that, that, that may be a difference. I said, because some of us, you know, our bodies or our, our, our family members have indulged so much that it's a spirit behind that, that will cause us to indulge. And I say, I don't want you to become one of those people you might think, you know, because your siblings, 
you know, um, are drinking wine or are drinking whatever that, that that's that's cool and that's something that you'll be able to do and get away with it. I told her, no, you might be, you know, the one, and I'm not speaking that over your life. This is what I said to her, but 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 be careful. I don't want you to, to get caught up thinking that that's something that you should do. Don't ever start drinking. Don't ever start smoking weed. Don't ever, you know, and and I know, you know, and I'm, I'm speaking um, also from, my um my oldest daughter you know who you know have and and i've been there i'm just saying i ain't, I ain't saying that you know no one takes that route you know but my oldest daughter admit that she drinks a lot you know um and 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 recently we had that conversation and she says um just so she can go to sleep because of all the trouble that she has you know and and i was able to share with her well drinking and smoking you should replace it with prayer you know what I'm saying? But I realized that those things can be generational, you know, and, and, and it's up for us to break it. You know, it's up for us to break it and to model it and to model um, model godliness, model the way that we should live, you know, in front of our children, you know, and yeah, that actually, they will be can, able to um, take Go ahead. I had a bit into that because Go ahead. It's, it's, it's not only that it can be generational. I mean, it is generational. Like that's, that's right here from the text. It is generational. Yeah. Sin is generational. However, because of the world that we live in today and that most people are followers, not only can sin be generational, but it can be cultural. So yeah. if the culture is approving of a certain behavior, the people that comes out of that culture will not be as willing to uh, disavow from that, that, that behave, that cultural behavior, like say womanizing, right? Because when we were kids, it was cool to act like you were something you wasn't, you know, I'm not saying some people were not those people. Some people were, but a lot of people were just making up these sex stories that they never even experienced. It just sounded good to fit in with the boys that you was doing X, Y, and Z, but you really wasn't. But see, what we don't know is the stuff that's coming out of our mouth, it's influencing people regardless. So somebody may hear that and they may be guided into doing something they shouldn't do because they think, well, Devin's cool. I want to be like Devin, but they don't know Devin lying. Devin didn't do that. Yeah. So now you've crossed the line that I never crossed. All because I'm trying to look cool. But see, that's what the culture does. Because we have rappers, we have ball players, we have artists, we have all kinds of people. And some, some of those people do live those destructive lifestyles. That is very true. But it seems like a lot of those people don't live those lifestyles. But they, they rap about it. They sing about it. So it's like, you don't want the consequence that comes with speaking those lifestyles into existence you want to be blessed by God, but you want to live the devil's life. It doesn't work. But because of this, this, this lack of accountability, we've created this culture that loves sin and keeps seeing, keeps seeing, continues to be recycled throughout our culture. This is why we deal with certain stereotypes. You know, it's, it's not just that everybody is racist. Yes, yeah, some people are definitely racist. But some of these people, they can't see the right thing because every person that they see that's of our of our of, of our um, people is stealing, is loud, speaking loud, is cussing every cussing, cussing every word or every other word. Like we just we don't know how to talk without using the wrong words, without using vile words, you know, or just the fact, you know, we, we don't want to pull our pants up. It's just it's, it's small things where it's like that's just not socially acceptable. But if the culture has been telling you for years to not care about what uh, nobody else thinks about you, you think that that's a, a, a badge to wear on your chest. I'm not saying don't care about people's opinion to the fact where, or I'm not saying to care about people's opinion so much that you allow yourself to be condemned by other people, but don't be so careless to their opinion. Don't be so closed off to their opinion that you become not self-aware. Like, I don't want to sag my pants, not because somebody doesn't like it, because I don't like it. I don't want to have open my mouth and have cuss words coming out of my mouth every single sentence because I know I'm educated. I have a college degree, for God's sakes. I'm not no idiot. So why should I be saying N word this and B word that and S word this and D word? Like, that's all the words I got. I graduated college, bro. I'm not no idiot. Why, why? Use the vocabulary you were given. So, like, I, I try to live my life a little bit differently. Not saying I'm always perfect. But I do try to live my life differently, not because of what people are going to say about me, but because I know that's not socially acceptable and that's not the image I want to put out about myself. So I'm counterculture. But think about it. How many people are truly counterculture? 
You know, how many people truly go against the culture that we're currently living in? Not many. So that's that that's what that's what it takes to break these generational curses, whether that's in your family or whether that's in the culture. You have to be counterculture or counter that counter whatever that sin is, right? I see in some people, some people's family lines where you know the first generation went to jail, the second generation went to jail, the third generation went to jail, and now the young kid he already cussing and holding guns. Like, who's gonna put a stop to this? Or do y'all want your whole family to end up in jail? That's the kind of thing you have to you have to like, bro, we're not going to do this. I don't care what your uncle doing. I don't care what your cousin doing. I don't care what your, your, your daddy doing. Do you want to go to jail like them? Is that what you want your legacy to be? Because if not, you need to stop this behavior right now. You don't always have to follow your family, right? Sometimes family is the people that you're born into, the blood that you're born with. And sometimes the family is the people that you choose to be around. Choose people that's counterculture. Choose people that's counter towards the lifestyle that you don't want to live. If you don't want to live a lifestyle of sin and debauchery, don't hang around people that's living in sin and debauchery. Hang around people that's striving for better, that want more, because they'll hold you accountable to that lifestyle that you want. And that's how you break those curses. But that's what I got to say about that. And that, that man, you just I just hate to keep chiming in. I know we got to keep moving forward, but that's that's like the main main thing that's that's going on in, in our in our time is the culture the, the the cultures the cultures of the world uh your business politics um arts and entertainment family religion you know government you know of uh, the they call it the seven cultural mountains all of those different cultures of the world are 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 systems they're systems of the world that kind of kind of where John talks about it in John, I think it's first John 215, love not the world, not of the things that are in the world. Um, because the, you have love for the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So what 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 I interpret and translate it as, you know. Hello? You you on mute. Oh, you can't hear me? Okay. <laughs> Man, I was talking. Um, yeah, I said that was so good. Uh, and because you hit on something major with, with the culture and 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 um we in our time we have uh what they call the seven cultural mountains. We have family entertainment, um, um government, um arts arts and entertainment, uh, you have religion. You have politics, you know, all of those different uh, seven cultural mountains. Um, they, they're, they're systems of the world. And so like J uh, John says in 1 John 2.15, love not the world, not of the things that are in the world because of the love of the father is not in them. You know, you, you realize I, I interpret it and translate it as we cannot become like those cultures, like embracing the habits, the nature, the characteristics of those culture, but we are as Christians, as citizens of heaven to represent Christ in those cultures. So that's just like, um, I was telling, you know, and I keep going back to my daughter Faith because I know this is time that we definitely have to be aware of where what's going on, you know, uh, with those around us. And and she watches stuff on TV, you know, and, and even some of the kids shows, you know, they, rep, they start representing a different type of culture where boys can like boys or girls can like girls and 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 I have to constantly tell her that's not acceptable because you you can you can you can't just there's no way possible um um unless I decide to not let her watch anything on TV or to monitor every every single thing that she watched so I try my best to do that but but I can't monitor her 24 7 of what she's watching so when I whenever I can I try to find out or whenever I catch something that's on television that's that's a different type of culture I bring to her awareness of what Christ culture is because she has to represent that even as an 11 year old kid she has to represent that among her peers you know and and not to be um, consume with her peers because a lot of people are peer pressured into things or to, into believing things. So, so yeah, you hit on something major when they talk about uh, culture. But we as believers of Christ should represent Christ, a Christ culture at all times. That's all I have to say. Now let's tackle this second um, subtitle, 
The second one is the covenant renewed. And that's in chapter 34, verse 10. It reads, and he said, behold, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, and lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods, and make sacrifice to their gods, and one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods, and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. You shall make no molded gods for yourselves. The feast of unliving bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you, in the appointed time of the month of Abib. For in the month of Abib you have come out from Egypt. All that open the womb are mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep. But the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem him, then you shall break its neck. All the firstborn of the sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. And you shall observe the feast of weeks and of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year all your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man cover your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left until morning. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Then the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the, co of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Once again, within this um, selection of verses, there's two things I want to cover. So the first part I want to cover is the fact that when you see in verse 11, where it says, observe what I command you to this day. Behold, I'm driving out from before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, Perizzite, Hivite, and Jebusite. He says, take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. Now, the following verse is going to that in a little bit more detail, but this is what we're talking about when it comes to generational curses, um, following the culture. So people don't look at it this way. And see, this is what causes danger to our people because we don't look at it from the spiritual aspect. We only look at it from the physical aspect, right? Physically, everybody around you may say that masturbation is okay. Physically, everybody around you may say that pornography is okay. They may say smoking weed is okay. They may say sex before marriage is okay. They may say anything. But see, what you don't see is when you agree with that idea, you're making a covenant with the, the demonic spirit that brought that idea forth. So just because this person is speaking this idea, you're not making a covenant only with that person. You're making a covenant with the spirit that's behind that person, right? Because God's spirit is telling us what we ought to do. It's in his 10 commandments. It's in his precepts that we follow. If we choose to follow something else, we've made a covenant with the spirit. And see, that's what we don't realize. It's not just sin in our flesh, it's sin of the spirit because now you're making a covenant with another spirit that's not God's spirit. So now you're not being guided by God, you're being guided by whatever false spirit that you chose to come, come into covenant with. So even, even and, and like I, I'm gonna make it very clear as well, because sometimes it's not just the physical act 
of masturbation or stealing or lying or whatever it is. Sometimes it's just the thought process. This is why the Bible says, cast down every wicked thought and every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Because if you agree to something that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, you have agreed against God. See, people don't think about that. When we say those who worship the Lord must worship him in spirit and in truth, that's what it's talking about. You agreeing, even if you have not done it, even if you have not masturbated yet, you have agreed that it's okay to do it in your mind. You have made a covenant with that spirit. So that spirit is just lingering, waiting around. When is he going to serve me? When is he going to take that next step and do the action? Because he's already agreed in his heart. In his heart, he agrees with me that it's okay to do it. So in your heart, you have turned away from God, even before you commit the action. That's why he says, do not agree with them, lest you make a covenant with them and it become a snare in your midst. A snare is a trap. It's going to become a trap. It's going to entrap your soul. That's why you have soul ties. Because the Lord says, do not have sex before marriage. But the culture says, or the demonic spirit behind the culture says, have as many people as you want before marriage. Because you got to try it out first. You got to see if you have uh, chemistry first, right? You got to do all these things first. So when you agree with that spirit, what you do is you, you do the action. And before you know it, you have a soul tie. And then you realize afterwards, when you're trying to repent, this is why God say don't do it. God didn't say don't have sex before marriage because he wants to ruin your life. He says don't have sex before marriage because I'm trying to protect you. I'm trying to protect you from what I know is going to happen. That, that demonic spirit is not going to tell you that. It's not going to tell you that you're going to have a soul tie. It's not going to tell you that you're going to have an addiction to masturbation. It's not going to tell you that when you watch pornography, you begin to objectify women. It's not going to tell you that. It's just going to say, it's okay. It feels good. That is going to tell you only the good parts. It's not going to tell you the evil parts of it. That you're going to be bound by this thing for 15 years. When you start masturbating to pornography, you're not going to be able to be intimate with your wife. Because she's not going to be good enough. You're going to be looking for this perfect woman that's on this, 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 this sexual channel that doesn't even exist. Because everything that they have is from surgery. So that's not a natural thing. You're looking for something unnatural in a world full of natural things. So what, what, what this thing is doing is it's becoming a trap and it's ensnaring your soul. It's becoming a trap in your midst. And this is what God is warning us against, coming in covenant with those things. And that that's it starts as small as agreeing with that. Agreeing with something that's wrong is already bad enough. And then when you commit the action, you get the result that's allotted to that action. So that's what I want to say about that portion. That was real good. I wanted to bring this scripture up. Uh, James 1, um, and I'll just read it uh, from verse 13. Uh, when tempted, uh, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person, this is the point I wanted to point out, each point, person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. That That is exactly what you were just saying. Um, um, it's a, that the desire, you know, that thought that's in the mind that, that is right there, that, that spirit, that covenant with the spirit, with the uh, ungodly spirit, uh, unclean spirit. Is, is there to tempt because there is an evil desire in the heart. And so uh, whenever we start to act out on those things, yeah, we give it birth to sin and then sin when it's habitual, it, 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 it becomes full grown and then it can, it can bring death and it can become death of, of, of relationship with God. You no longer, your conscience can be seared. That's why so many people, I believe, it's a lot of people that have gone to church, you know, and there are people that have even, um, um, you know, were on the track of getting their life right with God and somewhere they fell back into uh, a constant habitual lifestyle of sin. And when they fell back into it, there was no more conviction of doing right. You know, they had no more conviction of getting their life right. They just felt, okay, this is the way I, I got a lot of friends I've been seeing on Facebook that are still, you know, we're, we're straddling the wall. Some of them be on their verge of getting right, 
you know, and then some have, some have, some, some, I'm, I, I see some guys that was gangsters on the streets that, that I'm friends with that are now deacons in the church, you know, ministers of gospels in the church, but there's some that still, you know, uh, wanted to hold on to every um, habitual sinful lifestyle that they were. So, I, you know, so that's a good point what you said about the covenant with the un unclean spirit. That was good. Amen. So the second portion I want to talk about is, matter of fact, let me, before I even get into that, I think we need to read verse 15, because with all that I said, this gives you a, a more detailed um, spiritual aspect of it as well. It says, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, right? So that's what we're talking about. You agree, you're agreeing with someone that does not have the counsel of God. You're agreeing with someone that does not serve God. You're agreeing with their thoughts and their opinions. So lest you make a covenant with the inhabitant of the land and they play the harlot with their God. So he's saying they serve their God the way that they want to serve him, whether that be masturbation, homosexuality, stealing, lying, whatever it is, whatever those sinful things are, this is representing of them playing the harlot with their God, right? So they're playing the harlot with their God and they make a sacrifice to their God, which is the action. They make a sacrifice to their God and one of them invites you and you eat of his sacrifice. So you begin to participate in this action as well. You're eating of the sacrifice and you take of his daughters for your sons. See, so what that means is not only are you agreeing in covenant and principle to do the thing, you're actually doing the action. So now you're, you're actually participating in the sacrifice. You're participating in the ritual that pleases that demonic spirit. And as you do that, it becomes okay to you, right? Apostle Robert says you, your conscience becomes seared. So not only does your conscience become seared and it damages you, it damages your children. Because if that's okay for you to do, what you're going to do? The Bible says it right here. It says that you're going to offer your daughters to their sons. You're going to marry your kids to their kids. You're not going to marry your kids to a godly man because you're like, I don't agree with that godly man's opinion. I agree with this ungodly man's opinion. So I'm going to marry my kids to this person. And before you know it, even if you had a good upbringing, your upbringing gets stripped away from you because you become a part of that culture. But see, if you hang on to God's word and you marry within people that believe God's word and God's will, and you represent the salvation on the earth, you go against you go against the culture and you become a counterculture and your family line becomes one like Noah. One that God can say, he is perfect in all his generations. I can trust him. I don't have to kill everybody on the earth. I can start over with this man because he's perfect. He has not compromised. He has not bowed his knee to those spirits. He, he does not serve those evil spirits that, the, that, that pleases the people that's in the world. So I can use him and I can use his family. So that's the other side of it, the generational curse and the generational blessing because counterculture represents a generational blessing. The culture is the generational curse. The counterculture is the generational blessing. So I want to put that in there. And then just the second part about, you know, these last couple of verses is just everything you see after this, like about the unliving bread, you know, redeeming the, the male, redeeming the lamb. And if, if you, you know, redeem the donkey, if you don't redeem the donkey, you must break his neck. These are the same words that God spoke to Israel when they came out of Egypt. When he initially made the covenant, he told Moses to go up Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. So this is showing that God is able to forgive. He's able to forgive any sin because they had turned away from God, served other gods, created other gods, and made sacrifices to those gods. They had done every bad thing that this scripture just, just, just detailed. They did it all. And then God just redid it. He sent Moses back up the mountain. He gave him the Ten Commandments again. He made another covenant. He renewed the covenant that he had already made with them. He didn't, he didn't because the covenant was broken by them, he didn't throw the covenant away. He just renewed it. He said, I'm going to make this covenant again with you. And he gave them the same exact rules he gave them before. So it's never that God has pulled away from us. It's that we're pulling away from God. So let's make that very clear. But that's what I wanted to say about that, that, that second um, subtitle.
Keep going, bro. It's good. All right. So this third portion is the shining face of Moses. And it starts in verse 29. It says, now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel, whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. So I'm looking up a verse right now because I remember hearing this verse. I remember reading it first. Um, so I want to I want to bring that in because it talks specifically about this particular uh, phenomenon. Let's see. OK, yes, I got it. All right. So the shining face of Moses, you know, number one, being in God's presence is a supernatural thing. Right. It's a supernatural thing, but it can go one of two ways. You can be in God's presence and not be submitted to him. Right. Because. If you are saved, you are in God's presence. But are you willing to listen to what the Spirit is telling you? Because if you submit it to what the Spirit is telling you, he's cleaning you. That whole process, he's cleaning you every day, every moment, he's cleaning you. Do this, but don't do that. Think this, but don't think that. Eat this, but don't eat that. So on and so forth, right? But there's a verse in Ecclesiastes. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 8, and it's verse number 1. Who is like a wise man and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the sternness of his face is changed. So wisdom is what makes your face shine. It's not only that Moses was in God's presence, it's that Moses was submitted to God and received the wisdom that comes from God. So because he had received the wisdom that came from God and the people lacked that wisdom because Moses was leading them, to them, his face shone. He was different. He was set apart. He represented this new thing. We don't have what you have, Moses, because you're in God's presence for 40 days and 40 nights, and you're submitted to him. And you coming down with this new revelation, and it makes your face shine. Another instance that we see someone face shining amongst the people is Stephen, Stephen the martyr. When he was testifying of Jesus Christ, that he had died and he was the savior of the world to the Sanhedrin court, and they went to stone him, it says when he looked up towards the heavens, his face shone like an angel. Because he, was, he represented that wisdom. Because the people at that time, not the disciples, but the Sanhedrin court, they didn't want to believe that Jesus was actually the son of God. Even though he had died and rose again, there was a great earthquake. The veil in the temple had been torn. They had evidence. They just didn't want to believe it. So Stephen testified to Jesus Christ. And it said his face shone like that of an angel. And the same thing happens with you and me. When we testify to God's goodness, when we testify to the salvation of God, and we say what God has done in our life, not to people in the church, not to people that already believe, to people that don't believe, that's what attracts them to the gospel. Because something is different about you. It makes your face shine. Now, I'm not saying you're like a shiny statue or anything, but the sternness of your face is changed. Have you ever seen someone who talks, somebody talk about Jesus when they give their testimony? You just ask them, who is Jesus to you? You'll see their face completely change. Even if they were serious about the things that they were into before, once they meet Jesus, all that stuff melts away. And it becomes a different, it's like an all new creation. Their face is just different. They're smiling, they're happy, they're excited, they're full of joy. They love talking about Jesus. Why? Because this verse is true. Wisdom makes a man face shine. And the sternness, the seriousness of your face has changed. You don't have time to be twisted up. 
looking all mad and stuff. Because Jesus, there is no nothing to be mad about when you're in Jesus. There's just it's nothing but joy. So this is what that verse was representing to me, was that Moses was full of that wisdom because he was changed. He was changed by God, and he was to lead the people into change. So he was the leader that was selected by God, so God had to change him first so that he could lead the people into that change, which is why he received the Ten Commandments, right? So that's what I want to say about that little last portion. Amen. Good, 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 um, good word. I, I, I just want to say this, not counteracting what, you're, what you said, but I think... Um, I think we're all gonna get angry at some points, but but the point is not to not to sin. And Moses, even after this portion you read along, along of his journey, he struck the rock. He, he was he was very angry further along in the journey, uh, you know. And and part of that allowed him not to go into the promised land. But I think that when we get angry, let it be a righteous anger, you know, or let it be and or let it be something that. You don't let the sun go down. Like you say, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You know, just just be, he said, be angry. He said, be angry. Some things that you got to express emotions about, but don't sin. Be angry, but sin not. You know, so at the end of the day, work through that. Work, work through whatever you're going through. Give that thing to God. Let God continue to work in your heart, mind, soul, and, and strength. That's all I want to say to the people. But good word, bro. I'm just following you. And, and I want to say this about you, man, you glowing, you know, and, and I can see your glow and it, it reminds me, and it, every time I say it, you know, and, and it ain't to boost me at all, but I remember, you know, I was, I was glowing and it was, and I still glow, but, but I remember being young and, and Michael Aguilar was like, he said, bro, he said, sir, he said, man, you glowing. I want what you have, you know, and that's when he started to, to follow me. Uh, but, but, you know, keep the glow, you know, keep the glow and keep, you know, to everybody that's listening, you know, it's a fight. It's going to be a fight. But if we realize that it's a fixed fight, that's the thing about it. It's a fixed fight. Jesus won. You know, we, you know, it, it, the Bible say a righteous person falls seven times, right? So keep the fight, keep the faith and never give up on God. That's the mentality to have. Good word, bro. You blessing me. You bless me every time. I'm, I'm honestly saying that you bless me every time. And you've and 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 honestly, you know, with with even with my time, you know, a little bit more time than you, you've helped me grow. So I know that people that are watching, you know, are growing, you know, and 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 are are taking away nuggets because when you get some teaching, when you get the word, and then when you see somebody who has a passion for God. Just because you, you show that, bro, you just show you, you have a love for God. You know, you have a love for God and you have a zeal that is not without knowledge. You know, some people have a love for God and they have a zeal, but they have really no understanding of God. But you're growing in yours. So I'm just grateful for that because we all help each other to grow. So good word. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's um, Exodus chapter 34. And um, we'll be back soon with Exodus chapter 35.